Well, what's up, Northway? It is so good to be with all of you guys, man. Good to be back home. Love all of you. Dad jokes are the best. Happy Father's Day to all of you. I want to jump right into the Hebrew study that we've been in because I got a lot of ground that I want to cover today. So today I want to introduce you to my theological box. All right? What is a theological box? Theology, what is this? Theo, God. Logos, the word. It's the academic understanding, the pursuit of God intellectually. And we all have, whether we want to admit it or not, a theology. Think about the world. We all have a theology. We, we could slap a label on front of one of these boxes and call it atheist. And this is the academic understanding that God doesn't exist. Right? Th think about another big label in the world today, agnostic. Right? Th this is a label that would say, we cannot be certain if God exists. So we're, he, he could, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, but we're not certain. That's the academic understanding of some people. And then you have a whole bunch of different world religions, right? So on the front of this box, you could put Buddhism. You could put Hinduism, you know, Muslim on front of this box. That's the theological understanding of some folks in this world, right? And my guess is that most of us who are here today, we would subscribe to the theological box of Christianity. Right? And there's some essentials of the faith of Christianity, like the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we believe in as a part of our Christian theological box. Right? And we know that within Christianity, then, there's a whole bunch of these different little theological boxes that we call denominations. Right? And so let me just give you an example of how I kind of grew up and how I have come to an intellectual understanding known as my theological box, and you probably have yours as well. So I grew up in a great church, Beaver Christian and Missionary Alliance, a wonderful denomination, the CMA, right? And then when I graduated from high school, I went to a college because my mom worked there. I went for a free education at Geneva College. And at this particular college, they were a little bit different of a theological box, Reformed Presbyterian. And then I had a decision to make. Was I gonna step out of the box that I grew up understanding and would I come over here to the Reformed Presbyterian box, right? And so I had a choice to make, which one was I gonna be in? Right? And then when I graduated from Geneva College, I took my first time, first full time ministry position at a great church in Sewickley, Christ Church at Grove Farm, and they had a little bit of a different theological box. Right? It was, it was a great church, loved being a part of it, but man, it was a little bit of a different theological box, an Anglican tradition. So just different, not bad, just different. And then from there, Erica and I, we went to Detroit where we, we were a part of an incredible church, non-denominational church, but it had its roots in the Assembly of God Church. And it was there that I learned a whole bunch of different things about the third person of the Trinity. Like when I was growing up in this theological box, like when, we, when I was a kid, they referred to the third person of the Trinity. We were Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Oh, and man, I was a little bit afraid of ghosts as a kid. I didn't want anything to do with the third member of the Trinity. No, thank you. But however, when I went to Detroit, they began to teach and my pastor began to speak of the Holy Spirit. And this changed things for me. And as I learned some things about the Holy Spirit, I began to lean into that third person of the Trinity. I began to have experiences that shaped my theological box because of what I learned as a kid was not the same of what I was now learning. My theological box began to form a little bit differently. And then from Detroit, the Holy Spirit led Erica and me to plant a church back in Pittsburgh and it failed. Wonderfully, It was awful and awesome all in that same year, the hardest year on our marriage. And I began to have questions about my theological box like this. God, how could you call me to do something that failed? That was not a part of my theological box. Anybody with me on that? Right, and then from there, when the church plant was going down, you may have heard of this guy. He gave me a call, He's, his name's Scott Stevens, and he said, hey, we're doing a new thing at Northway Christian Community. Would you come and be a part of our theological box? And it was here that I learned so many things for 13 years that, how about, this is a big one for me, that you can have different theological boxes that exist in the exact same church and you can get along. When love reigns supreme, 
You don't have to argue over these things. You can chat things out in wonderful community. And it was here at Northway for 13 years that then God called Erica and me to stretch our theological box to become full-time missionaries with Campus Crusade for Christ in an organization called Athletes in Action. And this stretched our box. And it was while we were part of Athletes in Action, we still are, that in November of 2020, when the world was shutting down, that my brother got COVID. And 10 days after he got COVID, he died. And this began to shake and break my theological box. This did not compute with anything that I had learned along the way. And I began to ask questions of God. How could you? Like thousands of people were praying and believing in the God who can heal. And you said no. It didn't, it didn't meet my theological box, and I began to have an understanding once I began to climb out of that grief. And here was my understanding, is that God does not exist inside of our theological boxes that we try to fit around us. See, this is where God exists, up here. He says, my ways are higher than your ways. Where were you when I put the sun and the moon in the sky? Where were you when I said to the ocean, that's far enough on the shore? See, God says, my ways are higher than your ways. See, what we do in our theological boxes is we build these boxes around us. And I've come to understand, in our theologies, God will always exist outside of our theological boxes. And this is where the writer of Hebrews comes in. A long introduction to get us to Hebrews where we've been in this study. Because he's going to get to a point for six chapters he's been convincing his original readers and us as a church that Jesus is always going to be better than your theological box. He's better. He's more. And see, we've been holding on to these religious traditions that we have in this whole series. What the author of Hebrews has been saying is we've got to let go of some of these things that we prefer, the religious traditions that he's speaking to the original audience, this law-based preference that you have, and to fix your eyes on Jesus. This is what we look like. So I'm a visual learner. I love illustrations like this. So I'm actually gonna invite Pastor Ryan Paskey, my college roommate, to come up here and I'm gonna invite him to be Jesus. So why don't you come up here? <laughs> Susan, Susan says she, he's the cutest Jesus she, she's ever seen. But um, I wanna give you a, like a picture of what this looks like, what the writer of Hebrews has been trying to convince us of. Amanda begs in week one, she asked us a crucial question as she kicked off this series. She asked this, what can't you let go of to hold on to Jesus with both hands? And when she said that, I began to imagine this illustration. Because here's what I believe most of us who are here today, we wanna hold on to Jesus. In fact, we got one hand on Jesus. He's holding on to us. We're secure in our salvation. He, we're in relationship with him, but this is what most of us look like in our relationship with Jesus. We're holding on to the things that we prefer, the things that we fear, the things that cause us anxiousness and worry. And it's not that we're not holding on to Jesus, it's just that we're holding on to other things. And what the writer of Hebrews in this series, what we've covered already, is that we need to let go of things like fear. Let go of them. Let go of the distractions. Let go of the self-complacency, the things that we got going on. And here's the idea. What I hope to accomplish today in this sermon from the Word of God is that we will be able to let go of the anxiety, the things that are causing us worry, and to hold on to Jesus with both hands so that he can pull us up to where it is that he desires for us to be. See, this is the picture. He set us free from all of this stuff so that we can embrace Christianity and Jesus. This is my college roommate, everybody. We, right, right? So, and the fact that Jesus would embrace us fully. But we can't if we're holding on to these things. So my hope is that we'll be able to let go of anxiety and what's causing us worry today so that we can do this. Right? All right? Thanks, Ryan. Cute Jesus. Well done. All right? 
Everybody at all campuses, would you stand with me as we read God's word together? Hebrews 6, 13 through 20. I hope this is gonna help us today to let go of what causes us anxiousness and worry. Look at this, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, on himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people to swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is for final confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge, holding on to Jesus, might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has already gone as a forerunner on our behalf having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Thank you for standing in reverence for the reading of God's word. Go ahead and have a seat. We're gonna, you know, we've spent some time talking about the high priestly function and we're gonna talk about Melchizedek later. And so where I wanna camp out in this sermon today is this imagery of the anchor of the soul. Man, this passage is huge for us especially in a culture today where we don't know what to anchor ourselves to anymore. This is huge for followers of Jesus. So four truth anchors is what I wanna call them that come straight from this passage. The first one is this, did you see it? There is nothing or no one greater than God. See, Jesus, he, God had to swear on himself because there was nothing greater. In a court of law today, we say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, so help me. God, hand on the Bible, something greater. And God says, there's nothing greater than me. So I had to swear on myself this oath. Number two, God's character is unchanging. He says, I'm unchangeable. My purposes are unchangeable. You cannot thwart them. See, this should provide us in a culture that is ever shifting and ever changing minute by minute. This should provide us hope. God does not change. Same yesterday, today, and forever. Number three, huge truth anchor. God cannot, he will not lie. Why? It's impossible for him to lie, why? Because he is truth. Everything that proceeds from the mouth of God is truth, absolute truth. In a culture where we do not know what the talking heads on our screens, if they're telling us the truth or not, this should provide us hope, an anchor for our soul that God cannot, will not, it's impossible for him to lie. Number four, God guarantees his promises through Jesus Christ. This is huge for followers of Jesus. The apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, he put it this way, that all of the promises of God are yes and amen in the anchor of our soul, Jesus. All of the promises become our inheritance as co-heirs with God's son, Jesus Christ. And when we fix our eyes on Jesus, those promises become ours in Jesus. This anchor imagery is so powerful for us today because here's what I believe. Our worry and our anxiety starts rising in the gap between these false anchors and the true anchor of our soul. And so I wanna ask you a series of questions today because I think this will begin to provide us an answer for what is it that's causing us anxiousness and worry. So let me ask you this question. What is your mind anchored to today? Like, like what are you reading? What are you taking into your mind that you're anchoring to? What, what are your eyes looking at? What are your eyes anchored to? What, what movies are you watching? What social media feeds are you looking at? Let me ask this, what are your ears anchored to today? What type of music 
are you listening to in your ears? Who, what podcasts are you listening to? That you're not sure if they're actually telling you truth that is anchored to the anchor of your soul. Sometimes the stuff that we're taking in is absolutely contrary to the anchor of our souls and what he speaks and the promises that are true and yes and amen in Jesus. See, this is where I believe our worry and our anxiety begin to rise when we tie ourselves to these false anchors. So what are you tying yourself to today? And the encouragement from the writer of Hebrews, the encouragement of this whole series thus far is that we need to cut ties with these false anchors to let go of the rope. Writer of Hebrews has given us this imagery to not drop anchor on anything or anyone else other than the true anchor of our soul. So I put out a social media survey, getting ready for this sermon, right? And, and, And hundreds of you responded, either private message, emailed me, texted me, or right out on public for everybody to see. And I just simply asked this question. So what causes you to worry? What causes you to be anxious? And so I saw as these came in, three different categories begin to emerge. The first one was this, our future. Like what's gonna happen to me? What's gonna happen to my family, to our next generations? Given the culture that we are living in today, are we gonna be safe in the future? This is a question of protection. Are we gonna be all right? The second thing that I began to see is that it was a question of self. Like, do I have what it takes? Am I going to be able to make it through this? These were like answers of my physical health. Answers of, am I gonna be a good enough dad? Am I gonna be the man of God that I know I wanna be, but sometimes I slip and fall? Questions of our significance and our performance. The third category was this. I think this is everybody, money. Especially right now, right? When you go to the gas pump, you begin to feel that. For our future generations, am I gonna be able to have enough money? Am I personally gonna be able to make it through to the end of the week? Some of you, man, you know, we're, we're going to the pump and you're, you're, you're basically taking half of your paycheck just to get to work in your car with the gas prices. Will I have enough money? And so just in these general categories, maybe, maybe yours isn't there of what causes you stress and anxiety and worry. I wanna give us a process, I wanna get really practical of how do we let go of these false anchors that are causing us anxiousness and worry? Do you know how to get rid of these things? Because these are a lot of times very, I don't wanna say, they're simple to get rid of. So I wanna give us a process of how we can let go of this anxiousness and worry. And the first thing is this, I just simply want you to be aware of it. Your body's trying to tell you something when you feel that tightness of your chest. When you get to the point where, man, you just have a massive headache, do you know why you're getting that headache? See, in therapy, my counselor gave me this book called The Body Keeps the Score. The body's always trying to send us signals because we're a holistic being and it's trying to say, hey, something's off here. You don't have the peace that you would desire. And the body's trying to tell you something. So be aware of it. The second thing is this, to name it. This is so important. Don't let anybody else name it for you. Like we need to give it a name. And I'll I'll be honest here, you know, money has kind of been my thing ever since I was a little kid. I was a paper boy, right? And as I went to collect the money from the people and I began to make some money for myself, I watched sometimes as that money just went right back out. I was like, ooh, how'd that happen, right? And so I named my anxiousness and my worry about money, I named it my paper route money bag. Like that's for me because that's the first memory that I have of money just going and disappearing. And I'm like, how did that happen? Right, so I've always had this thing and I named it. One mom who came in on the the social media survey, she just named it the excess noise. My kids, they compete, right? And I've got this excess noise and it's like Trans-Siberian Orchestra all the time in my home and at least she named it. And now here's the, okay, this is usually where we stop. We just, and that's where we begin to worry and be anxious. But now here's the process of beginning to let it go. The third thing in this process, let's get really practical, is to share it. To share this out in prayer with God, 
and in community with other people. So is there something powerful when I know that there is a God who is nothing and no one greater than, and he wants a relationship with me, that when I bring that worry and that anxiousness and I lay it at his feet, there's something powerful to know that he's gonna take it with me. But then there's also something powerful that God gave to us. It's called the church. And what's so great about small group communities within this church is that you can share it with others. Like, man, you deal with that too? I deal with this as well. My guess is that young mom who would say like to other young moms, hey, I deal with the excess noise. They'd be like, me too, me too, me too. And they would all get in a small group and just be quiet, <laughs> right? <laughs> so like, that, that's, it's powerful to be able to heal in community together. There's something that's so powerful to say, I struggle with this worry, this anxiety, and to have other people raise their hand and say, me too. But it doesn't just stop there. We've gotta be able to learn this next step. It's so crucial in letting go and holding fast to the person of Jesus. We've got to be able to replace it with God's promises that are yes and amen in the anchor of our soul. Do you know how to replace your worry with the promises of God as pertains to the false anchor that you're holding on to? Do you know that God wants to speak into your worry and to your anxiety? Do you know that God already has? That he has promises over what is causing you anxiety? that when applied to your life, it begins to dissipate because you know that somebody greater, the anchor of your soul, is holding on to you in the midst of that anxiety and worry. But here as a pastor, let me just give you, uh, uh, like this causes me worry, is that a church in America today, we don't know the promises of God. In the most biblically illiterate generation, we have the scriptures at our fingertips. We can look it up on a Google click, but we don't know the promises of God. And we can't apply the promises of God to what is causing us anxiousness and worry if we don't know the promises of God. This is why it's so important, and I beg you to get your noses, your eyes, your ears into the word of God. Because majority of what it is that you are being anxious about, when you hear God's promises in your life, they'll start to be able to let go of them and hold on to Jesus. So I thought we would practice this this morning. On the big three that came in on this social media survey, I thought we would practice these promises. And, and these are just one promise. On, on, on these three categories, number one is this. Jesus himself, the anchor of our soul, said himself about our future. Look at what he said. I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. See, in the world, here's a promise. In the world, you will have tribulation. Future generations are going to have trouble in this broken world. You can count on it, but here's the greater promise from Jesus, the anchor of our soul. He says this, take heart, take courage, everybody, because I've overcome the world. And when we anchor ourselves to that promise, we can be confident that our future is secure and we're going to be okay. Number two, Let's take a look at my performance. Am I enough? Will I have what it takes? Look at what the writer of Ephesians says. Apostle Paul, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of your performance, your works, so that no one may boast. But look at this. For we are God's workmanship. That means we're his masterpieces. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Watch this, here's the promise, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. So if you're questioning today, do I have what it takes to be a good dad? The answer is no, not on your own. But when we anchor ourselves to the anchor of our soul, he has already prepared you. He's equipped you for every good work that he has called you to. That's just one promise about your performance. It's not about your performance, it's about holding on to the anchor. And he'll equip you to be that good dad, to be that great boss, 
whatever it might be. Number three, money, this is mine. And if you know my story at all, you know that this is exactly where I was gonna go because this verse is the reason why Erica and I jumped to become full-time missionaries. God spoke this specifically to us. Look at what Jesus, the anchor of our soul, said to those of us who worry about money and provision. Look at what he said. Therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, not about your body, not what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Here it is. Look at the birds of the air, a living illustration. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet, here's the promise, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than a bird? And then here's the promise, skipping down in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and here's the promise. All of these things that you are concerned about will be added to you. He knows you need them. He knows exactly what you need. And he will give it to you as we focus on the anchor of our soul. So this is just a way that we can practice replacing what it is that we are worried about with the truth and the promises of God's word. So I want us to be encouraged that these promises are yes and amen for us as well. But to be honest with you, This process works the majority of the time for me, but sometimes it doesn't. Because I've got some things in me that, I don't know how to describe them other than this, like they they have a hold on me. I'm here and I'm trying to let go of them, but I just can't. And so 90% of the time, this process works, but sometimes it doesn't. So by way of a poem that I wrote for today's sermon, I want to see if anybody else can resonate with me on this. If you don't know this, I love to write. And so I love to write poetry. I love to write about theology. And so I wrote this poem called Letting Go and Holding On. Here it is. I know who I am, but sometimes like COVID brain, My memory gets hazy and I try to fight the foggy drift to not be theologically lazy. See, I'm confident in God's promises, yet I'm riddled by this sin virus. It happens to the best of us, the rest of us, the mess of us. And I can't seem to escape the baggage that is now so noticeably heavy. I've been carrying it so long, becoming so comfortable with my closet anxiety. The uneasy fears of the what ifs of never having or being enough, I say I trust because I must. I'm a pastor, I'm a dad, I must. But to be honest with you, I'm never gonna measure up to the ever-moving measure and the unspoken expectations and the self-inflicted pressure. I wish there was some lever that you could pull just to let it all go, but it ain't that easy, we all know, because if it were, I would have exchanged it a long time ago. See, this is that space, that vulnerable place where my heart and my will are exposed. And this is where I need a doctor, a friend, someone to help me pry it from my hands, to help me understand the root, the original reason for my tendency to let it go and then to pick it back up again. Is anybody with me on this? Can I get an amen, right? See, the thing that I let go of and I don't want to think about or worry about the most takes up residence in my mind like an unwanted ghost, always ready to choke out the hope that I have at any moment. So again today, in this daily, if not hourly battle, I alert the evil one who's always trying to get me rattled that it's in my weakness that God is stronger and I'm no longer going to try harder, but I'm going to look closer into the promises of my savior. And the truth is this, he'll never leave me. He'll always have my back. As for everything that I ever need, he gave me his word that I and my family, we would never lack. Why? Because he holds the future in his nail scarred hands. He understands because he's with me, the overcomer, the one who with words created everything in the earth and sky. So I rehearse these promises and more when I begin to feel that uneasiness arise. And as I do, the hope and peace begin to swallow that worry 
So I'm fighting back with confidence because I'm resting in Jesus' victory. So today, I'm letting go again of what makes me anxious and I'm choosing to hold on to God's unbreakable promises. See everybody, I love to write. It's a part of my therapy. It's, it's how I prayer journal. That's how I share it with God. It's how I share it with other people. And so listen, as I close here today, I want to draw a distinction between two different types of anxiousness or anxiety, as our culture now calls it. And I want to, I want to say there is a first anxiety that doctors call facilitating anxiety. These are good things that we're worried about. Like, I want to be a good dad. And I wonder sometimes, can I be a good dad? That's, that's good to worry about, right? You know, this is what makes us good parents when we don't let our kids play in the street because we don't want them to get hit by something, right? That's good anxiousness, facilitating anxiety. This is what makes good leaders good leaders because they're looking out into the future to see what's coming, to see if it's gonna hurt their team or not or how they need to lead us into the future. Facilitating anxiety, it's good. Now here's the difference. When some of our anxiety begins to cross over the line into what doctors call debilitating anxiety, this is when we begin to fixate. This is when we begin to worry so much that our normal behavior becomes crippled. And when we can't seem to function in the way that we know that we were originally designed. And it crosses over a line and so when my brother died, I don't know how to say it other than like something broke in me. Like some of the nastiness that began to pervade my mind was unnatural. I didn't know where it was coming from. It was like, I thought I dealt with these things. I thought I let these things go, but all of a sudden here they were again and I wasn't sleeping. I, I was fixating on certain issues that, that, man, I thought that I had let go of in theophostic prayer, freedom prayer, you know, in conversations with pastors. I thought I had dealt with it. So here's what I did. I went to Erica and I said, something broke. And I need help. And I think I want to give the church permission when it, when it crosses over in that debilitating anxiety and you know that something broke inside of you. No, okay, let me give you an example. Tyson Alulu, right? Last year, a large NFL defensive lineman, he broke his leg in a game. None of us would go up to him and say, man, you are so weak because you went to a doctor to reset your leg, a surgeon to reset your leg. We would not say that he's weak or he's wrong for seeking out professional help. And sometimes when something up here breaks and our anxiety crosses that line into debilitating us, we don't give ourselves permission to seek out a professional. And so today in the church, I wanna give us permission. It's okay to seek out professional help. See, when I did that and I went to a therapist weekly after my brother died, she helped me begin to untangle the original reasons for what was holding on to me. And she helped give me the tools to be able to get untangled from these things so that I could hold on. And she pointed me to the anchor of my soul. Sometimes we need a doctor who can help us pry it from our hands. And I just wanna give you permission to seek out professional help if that's you like me. See, what I love about Northway, our church here, you might not know this if you're new with us today, is that they had the foresight a long time ago, 20 some years ago, to establish the Northway Counseling Services. Because our pastors, our elders, our team, we understood that sometimes it's a little bit more complex. And I'm not trained, I'm not a counselor to be able to help you untangle it from your hands. Because sometimes it is so deeply rooted in what the scriptures call a stronghold that I don't know how to help you pry it from your hands. Somebody professionally trained in that area of trauma or tragedy, whatever that trigger is for you, the Northway Counseling Center can help you. 
It's been a beautiful thing over the years to hear of the stories of how God has set people free from the things that they couldn't set themselves free from. So I would just encourage us as a church to take advantage of those things. So everybody be aware of it, name it. Don't be ashamed to share it out with God and other people. And then we've got to learn this process of replacing it with truth. And sometimes when that process doesn't work, get with somebody, a professional who can help you hold on to Jesus with both hands. It's so important. I love you, Northway. Let me pray for us. So God, thank you for the opportunity to share this morning. Here's what I know is that many across our church right now, they're trying to let go of these things. But God, I'm tired of trying. So I just wanna look closer at the promises that are yes and amen in the anchor of my soul. So God, help us today to let go of those things that are causing us anxiousness and worry. And then God, would you give the people courage who have crossed over into this debilitating, would you give them the courage to seek out professional help of somebody who can help them untangle and still be anchored to the anchor of our soul. We love you, Lord, and I thank you for Northway Christian Community. It's in Jesus' name that everybody said, amen.